Hello and welcome. So I got this comment about 12 days ago from Silly Content and he said what well, quite a few people have said when is part two coming and I kept saying it's coming. So a year and a half later, here it is. Um, if you'd like to follow Silly Content, uh, check his channel out. So if you've done part one, this is what you'll have. I suggest that you do that and the tutorial will be in the description below. And at the end of this tutorial, this is what we'll have. We'll have a character that we can move around with WASD. We can jump and he hits blocks. You can only remove blocks where the axe touches. So let's get into it. So first things first, we want you to go to your project settings. I'm going to put in right, left, up, down, debug, jump. Make sure that you add the key per each one how you want. You can use the arrow keys. I'm going to use WSD. For jump, I use space. And for debug, this isn't really important, but it might be good for use in the future. I use one. I don't want that temp camera anymore. We're going to place it on the player, but we don't have a player yet, which we'll do in a moment. So let's remove that temp camera. I no longer need this selector and the light will also be on the player. So I'm going to remove the light and I'm also just going to hide the selector. Then we're going to create an axe. So what I want you to do is go to your scene, make a new scene, and then make sure that it's at area 2D. Call axe, we're going to add a sprite and I've used a little axe I've created here. This will be in the project in GitHub, so the link in will be below if you want to get the art for this, or you can make your own, it's up to you. Then a collision shape 2D, and I've used a sphere, and you'll notice I've not put it on the axe, I've just put it to the right of the axe, and I'll show you why in a moment. Then add a timer, make sure that it's one shot, and leave the wait time as one as it default. I want you then to add an animation player. We're going to go to animation, new, and then create swing. You'll see that it's empty. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to change the scale of the sprite. And to do that, we can go to the sprite and we press this key here. By default, they're on one, one. So I'm going to go to, I'm going to, go to 0 0.5, which is exactly in the middle. Right click and insert key and do the same again for scale Y. Then I select them. I'm going to make them a little bit bigger. So 1.5 might be a bit too big. I'm not sure. The same for Y. Then I'm going to come over to 1, insert key, insert key, and put these back to 1. So you can see the axe is scaling up and down, and it's maybe a bit too big. So I'm going to change the values from 1.5 to 1.3. And also it's going slow, so I'm going to move the animation back a little bit. So let's say it's going to be 0 0.5. And then we can move the middle section back as well as the end section and also change 1.3 now we've finished our axe we want to add code to make it functional so go to your area 2d axe right click it and make sure to add a script i've named my axe and i would have one ready in my script folder on yours of course it will be blank with the ready front process so i'm going to explain what i'm doing so we've got two export vari variables. We've got the swing time, how long between swings we do. That's a float. We've got a node path to the tile map that we the axe is going to interact with because it needs to know where it is in space to uh, take the tile away. We're going to check if we're swinging, which is a bool. We're also going to make sure we get a link to the tile map. And we've got two on ready vars, swing, timer, and any player, which is the animation player. This just makes it easier to reference them in code. So the first thing I want to do is in our ready function, as soon as the axe loads up, we want to make sure that the node path is to the tile map. We'll do that later. Then in the physics process, I want to make sure the axe is always rotated to where the mouse is looking. So to do that, we have a look at, then we get the global mouse position and this way, the axe will always rotate towards where the mouse is located. Below that, you'll find that we have an input is action just press. So this is when we're holding the mouse left mouse down. When we do that, we start the swing. Now this line looks similar, but there's a difference and it's when we release. So when we release, we want to stop swinging. So we'll do start swing first, which is here. In this function, we're gonna tell the axe that we are swinging we're going to start the timer, swing time, and we'll make sure the animation player is playing swing. Below, the animation playback speed is one divided by swing time, one being the slowest and zero being instant. That'll affect how fast the axe moves. 
Then when we release the mouse left button, we will stop the swing and we'll tell the axe once again we've stopped. We'll stop the timer because we don't want it to carry on. We'll make sure the animation player is stopped because we no longer want it to be swinging. And then to make sure that the animation of the axe isn't at its biggest, we'll make sure it's always reset back to its original state, which is just 1-1. One, one. So here you'll see a function that's related to the timer. This is a signal, so I'm going to make sure that we understand what we're doing here by going to the timer, going to the node, and you'll see I've already got one here. I'm just going to remove this, and then I'm going to connect it again to the axe because that's where the, that's where the code is based. And this is swing timer time out. Now you'll see that we've connected to this procedure. We'll call the method hit block, which we'll cover in a moment. Then we'll check that if we are still swinging, then we've not released the mouse button. So we'll automatically start the swing again. And we achieve that with these two lines of code. So we start the timer to go again and we start, make sure the animation player is still playing swing. On hit block, this is where we're going to detect axis location to the tile map and reduce a block if one is present. I want to know the global position of the tile that the axe is located at. So the world to map is we're going to give it a position in real world space which will convert the tile map position. Now how that differs is on a tile map it's always going to be 0, 0, 1, 0, 2, 0, etc. Whereas in real world space it could be 16, 32, etc. So we need to make sure that we know what tile we're going to touch by giving it the position of the collision shapes, which is here. We then want to get the ID of the tile we are touching. Now, don't forget, if this is an empty tile, it'll be a minus one. You'll see here, this is ID zero, one, two, three, and so on. And right here, you'll see there's no actual sprite. That's because it's an empty tile, and that'll be minus one. So for example, you can see this is zero. So if we want to hit it, we would add to the ID to get one, then two, etc. Now we know this is going to be a tile position. We need to get the ID of that tile. So to do that, we're going to get the tile map again. We're going to get the cell, which I guess is another word for tile. And then we're going to make sure that the tile X and tile Y, which if you were touching the very first tile, it would be zero, zero and then that will retrieve the ID of that specific tile. So if it's not an empty tile and the ID is less than five, because obviously I don't, I don't have any more tiles than that, then we know we've hit a mud block. If the ID is four, then we can no longer add to this mud block. We can only remove it because there's no tile after that. And we do that here. We set the tile using the same coordinates again, but we set it to minus one. Else we can hit the tile so we can increase how much it's been hit by and change to sprite. And to do that, we go here, down, through and else, tile map, set tile, and once again, pass in the location, and then we add to the ID. You can see down here, I've done a to-do for particle effects, so you could spawn some particles when you hit the tile. That'll be in a future tutorial. So that concludes the axe. Now we're going to work on the player. Like with the axe, I want you to add a new node, but this time I want it to be a kinematic body 2D and name that player. I then want you to add the axe scene. The player obviously needs a sprite, so we're going to add a sprite, and I've used a, probably the worst character I've ever drawn, but it's free, it's there if you want to use it for whatever reason. Um, one thing I have changed on my sprite is on the offset, I've turned centred off because because it's an uneven number, one five. There's no like, in-between tile, so it just makes, it's just not pixel perfect. I've added a collision shape, which is a rectangle, and you can see the extents here. I've just made it so it's covered just about this much. I wanted to give some leeway for his arms and head. I've made sure to add a camera to the player. I've also made sure it's current. Please make sure that's checked. I've zoomed it in as well because the sprites are so small that you want to zoom this in, this is quite important. I've added a 2D light and I've enabled it of course and the texture is down in the art again. This will be with the project if you want to get in GitHub, please do. 
and I've added a coyote timer. I've made sure it's a one shot and I've kept the default timer as one. So I want you to add a script to the player. I've already done so. I love this code if you've done platforms before will be repetitive. So I'm not going to go into the movement code as much because it's not vital to this tutorial. If you've done a platform tutorial, again, there's many out there. This is no different. So we've got the eggs. We've got gravity, acceleration, deacceleration, max move speed, jump high. I've made mine a little bit high for this game, but it doesn't really matter. You can do as you wish. What our vertical speed is, our horizontal speed, our move speed. Are we touching the ground? We've got Kyoto time. I'm not really going to cover this because I've cut it so many times in other tutorials, and I suggest you look at them. I'll leave a link in the description below for a polished platformer tutorial. So I'm going to scroll down quite slowly, and if you want to pause the video to data entry it yourself, but I recommend just copy and pasting the code. Um, so here we go. So once the play is done, we want to add him to the main scene. I can just add him like so. We're going to right click, let him do editable children because we need to get the axe and the axe needs to know where the tile map is so we're going to assign that now brilliant so now the now the axe will be able to interact the tile map because bef without it it's an empty tile map and moving a player around is a little bit tricky like this you want to left click the player and then we're going to make make group selected nodes this way it's just easy to move player around for accidentally selecting its children also, it might be tempting to put the player down here, but because of how I've generated the map, there could be some uh, mud here. So you always want to have it on top. What we're going to do in the future tutorial is right in the middle, I'm going to force the time map to always have blocks here. So this way, no matter how the generation goes, there's never going to be an empty space directly below you because that would be a bit unfair to the player. So let's press play. And as you can see, it's even when we're zoomed in, the player is quite small. You can see the axe is going to follow the mouse. I'm holding, so yeah. So everything works as expected. The player jumps very high. On the next tutorial, I'm going to focus on spawning gems. And there'll be blocks of gems together, sort of like Minecraft. You find one diamond, you might find another. And the further down you go, the more likely it's to find a rare diamond. This will encourage more deeper exploring. I'm sorry this content was a year and a half late. Um, the next one won't be. I've got a lot of time on my hands recently. To those people that like stayed with me and kept asking to the content you included, thank you because it gives me motivation to keep doing these videos. There's lots of really fantastic tutorials out there now. So I feel like I can just sit back and watch them because they're fantastic. But for the people that are still around, thanks very much. And I'll see you in the next one.